It's good to be here again this afternoon for me. Good morning for you. And uh, looking forward to uh, having the privilege of sharing God's word with you today. As has already been mentioned, the program is entitled Acans in the Camp. And today's message is not really a soft, flowery message. It's a little bit more of a challenging one, a challenging one to all of us individually in our faith. And I want to start by opening our Bibles. If you have a Bible with you there, if you don't, I encourage you to go and grab your Bible because we're going to be looking today at the story of Achan. Now, some of you might not know the story of Achan, but you soon will. And it's a very interesting story. It's a, it's a story about a man who got himself into some big troubles, but those troubles didn't just stay with himself. It affected the whole of Israel. And we're going to start our, our program today Looking at Joshua chapter 6, if you have a Bible there, open your Bible to Joshua chapter 6. And we're going to look at verse 18 and 19. Now, the background of this is the children of Israel have been wandering in the wilderness for many, many years. They've come finally to the borders of the promised land. They're about to enter into the promised land. And they're about to take one of the, the first major cities, the city of Jericho. And before they go in, God gives them a very solemn warning. And that warning is in Joshua 6, verses 18 and verse 19. The Bible reads as follows. It says, And ye, in any wise, keep yourselves from the accursed thing, lest you make yourself accursed, when you take of the accursed thing and make the camp of Israel a curse and trouble it. So God says to the children of Israel, the whole camp, before they go in to take down the walls of Jericho, he says, keep yourself from the accursed thing. Don't touch it. Don't take it. And in verse 19, he says, but all the silver and gold and vessels of brass and iron are consecrated unto the Lord. They shall come into the treasury of the Lord. So here God gives a very solemn warning. He says to the children of Israel, you're about to go into the promised land. When you go there, when the walls of Jericho come down, do not take of the accursed thing. Everything was to be left. Everything was to be destroyed, except for the silver, the gold, the brass, and the iron. That was all to be taken, and that was to go into the treasury of the Lord. It was to go into the church, we could say, in our, our, our modern language. And we find here when this warning was given, everybody heard it, everybody knew about it. But the Bible tells us that Achan disobeyed. He disobeyed the commands of God, and he took of the accursed thing. We pick up the story as it continues on. The walls of Jericho came down, and um, we pick up our story now a few verses later in chapter 7 and verse 1. It says, But the children of Israel committed a trespass in the accursed thing. For Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took of the accursed thing, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against the children of Israel. So here we find the Bible tells us <clears throat> that Achan took of the accursed thing. It says he disobeyed God's command. He took of the accursed thing. And not only was the, 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 the cursing a curse to his own life, what the children of Israel didn't realize is that the whole camp had been cursed. The curse came upon everybody. But the trouble was nobody knew what Achan had done. He had done it secretly. But the first lesson we can learn from our study together this morning is that our sin doesn't always just affect ourselves. Our sin can have a, uh, a ripple effect. It ripples into the family, it ripples into the church, it ripples into the community. Our sins don't always affect ourselves. And we must be very careful because we can sometimes think, well, if I've done a certain thing, it just affects me. No, it doesn't. It affects a lot more than just yourself. And as a result of disobeying God, the blessing was removed from Israel, from the whole camp of Israel at that particular time. Now, because nobody knew what Achan had done, Joshua and all the other people in the camp were excited. The walls of Jericho had come down. A great victory had been won. And not far away from Jericho was a small little place called Ai. And the Bible says that they sent men, Joshua sent men in verses 2 and 3 to go to Ai and to search it out. Let's continue our story in Joshua chapter 7, verse 2 and 3 now. Now remember, nobody in the camp knows what Achan has done. Verse 2, And Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai 
which is beside beth Aven on the east of Bethel, and spake unto them, saying, Go up and review the, and view the country. And the men went up and viewed Ai. Verse 3, And they returned to Joshua and said unto him, Let not all the people go up, but let about two or three thousand men go up and smite Ai, and make not all the people to labor thither, for they are but few. So the men go, as Joshua asked them, they come back with the report and they say, Joshua, don't send all the people up there to Ai. It's a little tiny place. We've just taken the walls of Jericho down with God as our strength and you as our leader. We don't need to send the whole camp. Just send two or 3,000 men. The Bible goes on there and tells us they send two or 3,000 men up to Ai. But when they got there, the men of Ai defeated them. The Israelites ran back. Some of them were slain. About 36 men, I think the Bible said there, were slain. And they come back and they're just stunned. They've taken the walls of Jericho down. It's a massive city. And now they can't even take the, city, the, the little town of Ai. And Joshua and the leaders of the church are distressed. We pick up our story in verse 6 because Joshua goes in before God. It's in Joshua 7 and verse 6. And Joshua rent his clothes and fell to the earth upon his face before the ark of the Lord until eventide, he and the elders of Israel, and put dust on their heads. So Joshua falls before God, pleading for an answer to what has happened. Why has this taken, taken place? And we drop down to verse 10, and we get God's answer to Joshua. And in verse 10, the Bible says, And the Lord said unto Joshua, Get thee up, wherefore liest thou thus upon thy face? So he says to Joshua, get up, stop praying. What are you laying around for? In verse 11, he says, Israel has sinned and they have also transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them. For they have even taken of the accursed thing and have also stolen and dissembled also. And they have put it even among their own stuff. Verse 12, therefore, the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but turned their backs before their enemies because they were accursed. Neither will I be with you anymore, except you destroy the accursed from among you. So God says to Joshua, quite plain and blunt, he says, get up. What are you laying on your face for? You need to do something. You have the accursed thing in the camp. I cannot help you until you sort that out. And here we see the sin of Achan has hindered the whole work of the church, the work of, of, uh, of taking the land of Canaan. He had taken the accursed thing. Now, of course, the question is, if you don't know the end of the story at this point, what had Achan actually done? What had he actually taken in these verses? Well, if we drop down to verse 21, we find what Achan had actually done and what he had taken that had caused such a grievous situation to come upon Israel. Verse 21 now. Joshua 7, verse 21. This is after he's been caught out and he confesses to what had happened. He says, When I saw among the spoils a goodly Babylonish garment and 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold, about 50 weight, uh, shekels in weight, then I coveted them and took them, and behold, they are hid in the earth in the midst of my tent and the silver under it. So here we find he confesses, he's been caught out. <clears throat> He confesses that he took the accursed thing and he says, I took a garment, I took silver, I took gold that God forbade them to take. And once in Achan's uh, sin here, we find that it affected the whole church. It brought the whole church to its knees. And the question we've got to ask ourselves here, because we're similar to the, to the days of the children of Israel. They were heading into the promised land. They're on the borders of Canaan. They're about to take the country, about to... Uh, to enter into the promised land that God had promised them. And as a church today, we're in a similar situation where on, we could say, the borders of the promised land. We expect Jesus to come soon. The end of all things is at hand. And God is going to take us to the, to the real promised land, the kingdom of heaven. And what happened here was, just as they're going into the promised land, Achan hindered the whole church. He weakened it to its knees. And the question this morning we've got to ask ourselves is could there be Achans in the church today? Achans in the church that are actually doing the same thing, weakening the church, sort of drawing the power out of the church that we need and preparing us to fail in taking the promised land. I think the answer to that question is yes. 
And I know it's a yes because in the book Five Testimonies to the Church, page 157, there's a powerful statement there that I want to read. And it reads as follows. It says in Five Testimonies 157, it says, instead of giving all for Christ, many have taken the golden wedge and a goodly Babylonian garment and hid them in the camp. If the presence of one Achan was sufficient to weaken the whole camp of Israel, can we be surprised at the little success which attends our efforts when every church and almost every family has its Achan? Did you hear that last part? It's quite a powerful, frightening statement. It says that every church and every, almost every family has its Achan. So if every church has its Achan, the serious question we need to ask ourselves today is, am I the Achan in the, in the camp? Could I be like a spiritual parasite that's draining Christianity of its power? Could it be that the reason why so often the church seems to regress rather than progress, why it often seems to have so little power, is because maybe I am an Achan in the camp? Could it be that these accursings that we've brought into our midst, into our, whole, <clears throat> our lives, into our homes, into our churches, are bringing us to a situation where God says, I cannot be with you any longer until you deal with these things. Now, of course, the question is, well, what does it really mean to be an Achan? Where, where did Achan's sin really lie? If we go back to verse 21, the verse we read just before, Joshua 7, verse 21, it says these words here again. It says, When I saw among the spoils a goodly Babylonian garment and 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold of 50 shekels weight, he says, Then I coveted them. Verse 21 here, we find the answer. He says, Then I coveted them. Coveting was the prerequisite to Achan's sin. Achan's sin really lay in the breaking of the 10th commandment, which you would probably know quite well. To summarize it, thou shalt not covet. You know, coveting is one of the, probably the most misunderstood and confusing of all the Ten Commandments to most people. They look at it and think, oh, that you, you shall not covet. The reason that most of us don't really understand the difference of what coveting and, and, and having possessions also is, is we don't understand the difference between often a want and being covetousness. You see, the Apostle Paul talks about covetousness in uh, Colossians 3 and verse 5 and he also talks about it in Ephesians chapter 5 verse 5 and there he calls covetousness idolatry the reason I believe why he calls it idolatry is because coveting is not just talking about a want but about an inordinate desire an out of order desire something we desire more than moral principle or something we desire even more we could say than God this word covet means a life-dominating, intense craving or a desire for something. That's what coveting really is. For example, if you're, just to try and give an example of this, if, you, if you're a fisherman and you went fishing, I'm not much of a fisherman, but just say you're a fisherman and you went fishing with your friend and your, fish, your fisherman friend has a, has a fishing rod and it's a fantastic rod, it has all the gear and he's catching all these fish because he's got this rod that's just right for the fishing and the, the, uh, the type of fish that's been caught, let's say. And just say you look at that rod and you think, oh, I want to get myself one of those fishing rods. The question is, are you coveting? Are you coveting your friend's fishing rod? I would say not really. You see, you're looking from a practical purpose that it's a better rod and it will make you a more successful fisherman, we could say. But the want to have that fishing rod and to have one of those fishing rods, but the want of it, and the want to have it is also a dangerous situation because it can turn from a want into something that's covetousness, a desire, a desire that you have to have the fishing rod, something that you'll be willing to sacrifice moral principles to get, or something you cannot be content till you have a hold of. You see, coveting is really wanting something else more than moral principles or a relationship with God. Coveting is saying there's something besides God, his love, his salvation, the eternal gospel, that I have to have as a requirement to make me happy. That's coveting. And that is the essence of sin. And this is what Achan did. He saw 
what he heard, sorry, what God had said. He knew that the accursing was to be left alone. He knew the gold and the silver was to go into the temple of God, but he decided, he coveted, he wanted that more than obedience to God. That led him to the sin of covetousness. And of course, the danger we face today, particularly in our modern world, <clears throat> is there is so much stuff. Our modern society, our affluent societies are becoming more and more filled with stuff. And we can have the danger of coveting. We want one of this, we want that, we want this, we want that. It becomes the all-absorbing theme above the relationship with God, affecting our relationship with God. What's also interesting, if you look back at Joshua chapter 7 there, in verse 11, it says, Israel has sinned and they have also transgressed my covenant, which I have commanded them. For they have even taken of the accursed thing and they have also stolen and dissembled also and they have put it even among their own stuff. You see, friends, we all have stuff. I'm using the old King James Bible there, and it says they put it amongst their own stuff. We all have stuff, but the trouble is too much of our, our stuff is, first of all, cluttering our lives up. But the other question we've got to ask ourselves is how much of God's stuff do we have amongst our own stuff? If you understand what I'm saying. Do we have the accursed things in our possessions? Or worse still, do we have things that belong to God, his gold, his silver, money that should have gone into the treasury of God, but it's amongst our stuff. You know, Jesus said those famous words in Luke 12, verse 15, a man's life consists not in the abundance of the things which he possesses. And this is such simple logic, really, but we spend most of our lives in this world amassing a mountain's amassing a mountain of stuff or things of possessions only to realize that at the end it all erodes away anyway moth rust thieves it all corrupts but the whole world seems to have bought into satan's lie and deception today they want more and more and more possessions i remember years ago i saw a a sticker on the back of a car and the sticker on the car said he who dies with the most toys wins and that seems to be where the world is today. It's like we just want more and more and more and more and more possessions. It's like he who dies with the most toys wins, but it doesn't really make a lot of sense when you die, you lose all your toys. But we don't expect too much more from the world. But what we find here in this story is we're talking about Achan. Achan wasn't just out in the world doing his business and doing his stuff. He was in the church. And today we've been told that every church and almost every family has its Achan in the church. Who is the Achans in our church today? Maybe it's us. We need to find out. Now, I've broken this down as I've studied this out, and I've broken down Achan sin into five points. There's five points that we can look at where Achan did the wrong thing. The first point that he did, quite a serious point, is he stole from God. Number one, he stole from God. Now, that's a horrific statement if i was to say to you today i've done the wrong thing and i've stolen from someone else that'd be pretty bad you'd be pretty shocked thinking wow this, this guy's supposed to be a in ministry and a, a preacher and living the christian life and he stole from someone but just imagine if i said i stole from god the concept of stealing from someone is bad but the concept of stealing from the almighty god is horrendous isn't it but here we find in Achan's story, Achan stole from God. He took what belonged to God. All the silver, all the gold was to be God's. It was to be put into the treasury of the church. And Achan took it for himself. In Third Testimonies 269, page 269, it says these words. It says, And I saw that many who profess to be keeping the commandments of God are appropriating to their own use the means which the Lord has entrusted to them and which should come into his treasury. They rob God in tithes and offerings. They dissemble and withhold from him to their own hurt. They bring leanness and poverty upon themselves and darkness upon the church because of their covetousness, their dissembling, and their robbing God in tithes and offerings. The question for us, I suppose, individually to ask ourselves this morning is, am I robbing God today? Am I taking really what belongs to God and appropriating it to myself? 
And we often read the story of Achan and think, where could he take the silver and gold that was from the, for the church? It was to go into the sanctuary. How could he take it and keep it for himself? And the answer is quite simple, the same way that we do. You see, when we look at our church today, if you look at the Seventh-day Adventist church today, we understand that God wants us to pay tithes and offerings. We understand the sacrificial system of giving our tithes and offerings to, to the work of God, to support the ministry, support the church, to grow the church and to bring more souls into the kingdom of heaven. We understand that. But the sad part is, if we look at the statistics around the world, that a large portion of the church doesn't pay tithes and offerings. So if they don't pay their tithe and their offering, what are they doing? They're robbing God. They're no more than an A-can in the camp. And it's so easy to spend money on ourselves, but to put money into the church. It's so easy to spend money on maybe going out for a meal or buying ourselves some new clothes. But when we have that same money in the church and we're going to put that into the offering plate, it's quite amazing how it seems to just stick into our hand. It's hard to let go of it. And the reality is that many Christians today don't pay a faithful time. They don't faithfully support God's work. They're busy about making money for themselves and using them part that should go to God and putting it among their own stuff, we could say, as the, year, as the, uh, the story of the Bible told us there. Or we can bring a lame offering to God. You know, I'm thinking of the story of Ananias and Sapphira back in Acts chapter 5, where they sold a portion of land. They said, we'll sell this piece of land and we'll give the money to the church. And when they sold them the land, they decided, well, we won't give all the money. We'll give half of the money. If I come to you today or someone came to me today and said, oh, we're going to sell this piece of land and we're going to give half of the money to the church. I would say that's quite an amazing offering. That's a, that's a very you know, wonderful thing a person would do. And they gave half, but they were still cursed. The reason they were still cursed is because they promised to give everything. But they took half and kept it for themselves. You see, you and I can give lame offerings to God. Sometimes we come to church and we throw a few coins in the plate. We haven't even thought about it. You know, God sacrificed himself. He gave his only begotten son that we could have eternal life. He has given the whole of heaven. And friends, who are we to come to church and throw a coin in the plate and not be prepared to sacrifice of our own means for the kingdom of God and put it amongst our own stuff? So here we find Achan robbed God. As a result of robbing God, we can often give ourselves a situation where we're losing the blessing. You know, in Malachi chapter 3 and verse 10, God doesn't need our money. He doesn't need our tithes. He doesn't need our offerings. He doesn't need anything. He owns everything in the first place. The reason why he allows us to be part of giving is to be part of the church, to be part of the work, part of the sharing the gospel, but it is also because God wants to give us a blessing. In Malachi chapter 3 and verse 10, you probably know the verse where God says, Prove me now, he with says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. God wants us to give that he will bless us and he will support us and he will guide us. But sadly, the money we often should be putting into God's work is not put into the work, it's put into our own pockets. Coins, God's coins in our pockets. Patriarchs and Prophets 497 says it this way. It says, among the church members, in good and regular standing, there are, at last many Achans. Many a man comes statedly to church and sits at the table of the Lord, while among his possessions are hidden unlawful gains, the things that God has cursed. For a goodly Babylonish garment, multitudes sacrifice the approval of conscience and their hope of heaven. Multitudes barter their integrity and their capabilities for usefulness for a bag of silver shekels. How is it with us today, brothers and sisters? Are we stealing from God? Are we like Achan taking things that belong to the Lord? So the first thing that Achan did, he, the first part of his sin was he stole from God. The second part is that Achan coveted the things of Babylon. If you remember the verse where he, he admits to what he had done, he said that I have taken a goodly Babylonian garment and he hid that garment amongst his own stuff. Now, not only are there many Christians using God's money for their own wants, but they are also often coveting the things of Babylon. It's interesting how he called it a goodly Babylonian garment. Now, when you go to the Bible and the Bible prophecy, particularly in the book of Revelation, 
in the end time prophecies, Babylon represents the great enemy of God. It's the enemy. In the, in the last days, it's the true church of God versus Babylon. And Babylon represents a lot of things that we haven't got time to go into now. But for, for, in a nutshell, we could say Babylon really represents the world. And we find in 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 to 17, the things of the world God calls us to turn away from. He says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but of the world. And the world passes away and the lust thereof. But he that does the will of God abides forever. You see, everything in Jericho was to be destroyed except for the silver and the gold. And when you and I accept Christ as our saviour, the accursed things of the world, the, the goodly Babylonian things of the world, we could say, are to fall away. We are to be dead to the world, alive to Christ. They are the accursed things. And we find in our world today that there are many cursed things. Of course, it is a bit like Achan's day, the goodly Babylonian garment, the clothing. Of course, we have the the, the diet of, of, the, of, of the world as well. We have the amusements and pleasures. We have the movies and games and toys and possessions and all these varying things. And some of them, not necessarily things that are sinful in and of themselves, but they absorb our attention and we forget that we're on the way to the promised land and we get caught up in the things of, we could use the word Babylon. And it's at this time God is trying to get us to focus our attention off the things of the world and to focus our attention on the promised land. In the days of Achan, he was trying to focus their attention on not the people that were in the promised land, the, the uh, people like in Jericho and the stuff that they had, but on taking the promised land and making it a special place for God's people. But Achan was too busy focusing on the things that were in Babylon and coveting them and sadly possessing them. And he took them, he took that goodly, so-called goodly Babylonian garment and stole it when God said it was to be destroyed. And this brings us to our third point. So we have Achan stole from God. Two, Achan coveted the things of Babylon, of the world, we could say. And number three, Achan stole God's time. It's interesting when you look at this, because while everybody was busy in Jericho doing God's work, taking the promised land, Achan was busy about his own business. He had his own little business enterprise happening, didn't he? Everybody else is working for God and taking the promised land. And while they're all doing that, what's Achan doing? He was busy accumulating his own possessions and not about the work of God. They were to be busy taking the promised land, taking the kingdom of heaven. And I think the parallel is very simple for you and I. We are to be the same. Yes, we have to live in the world and we have to have a job and life has to go on. But our focal point is to be busy taking the kingdom of God, taking the, the everlasting gospel to the world, exposing through the three angels' messages the deceptions of the last days. That is to be our primary focus, not running our own show and letting everything else be done by the rest of the church. You know, in Daniel chapter 7 and verse 18, it says there, if you've read that chapter and studied it out, you've got the, the, the beast and a little horn and the antichrist power that takes place there. At the end of that whole prophecy that Daniel saw, it says there that the, the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess it. And the words and the language that's being used there is taking the kings, like we're going to take the city. In the old language, they, they took Jericho, we could say. In other words, they had to enter into the battle, enter into the fray, enter into the warfare to take the, king, the city. And we have to do the same. We have to be busy taking the kingdom of God. We do that by preaching teaching, sharing, upholding the, the, uh, the message of the church, sharing the three angels' messages. But Achan wasn't doing that. He wasn't busy with that. He was busy doing what? Taking the things that God says were accursed, taking them into the church and bringing a curse on that church. In other words, he robbed God of his time. You know, God miraculously opened the doors for Israel to take Jericho and Achan used the providence of God for himself. How about us? Could it be that God is opening the doors for us? He's blessing the church with time and money and health and wisdom and freedom and, and truth and knowledge. 
but we're taking this and just thinking, oh, well, this is good, but we'll just sort of get busy with our own thing. We'll let somebody else in the church. All the other church members can do it, but oh, I'm busy with my own stuff. How is it with us today? Are we Achan's in the camp? So here we find Achan stole, Achan stole money from God. He desired and coveted the products of the world. He was busy about his own work rather than being busy about working for the kingdom of heaven. And the fourth point, which is a terrible one, is that Achan brought the accursed thing into his own home. If you read the rest of the story, we won't read the, the rest, but Achan lost his life. But not only did Achan lose his life, it also destroyed his entire family. So Achan brought the accursed thing into his home and it affected the whole of his family. Today, many people are the same in the church. Many of the modern day Achans, they bring into their homes the accursed things of the world. They bring them into the house that permeates through that house and brings a curse into their homes, into their families, into their children, into their, into their wives' relationship with God. The reality is, if I say it real plain, this is the real plain way of saying it, Achan's whole family was, de was destroyed as a result of him bringing the accursed thing into his house. And many Christians, I'm afraid to say, are doing exactly the same thing. We import into our homes the goodly fashion, the entertainment, the, the food, the, 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 the misappropriation of God's money. We spend our time on ourselves and have no time to work for God, no time for family worship. And without us often realizing it as parents, we have flooded our homes and our families with the accursed things and we can't work out why things are going wrong. And often we find ourselves like Joshua where we fall down on our face, praying before God, asking God, what's going on? But the story of Joshua in verse um, <clears throat> Joshua 7 and verse 6, and Joshua rent his clothes and fell to the earth upon his face before the ark of the Lord until eventide, and he and the elders of Israel and put dust upon their heads. But what did God say to him? In verse 10, he simply said, And the Lord said to Joshua, Get thee up, wherefore liest thou thus upon thy face? In other words, he said to Joshua, Get up. Stop praying about this. I'm not listening to you anymore because the issue isn't praying. The issue is doing. Many parents are sort of spending time before God, praying for their family, praying for their home, praying for their children. I think many times God is saying, forget the praying, get up and do something about it. You've got the accursed thing in your home. If you don't get it out, I can't help you. You have to make the choice to follow the principles or follow the truth that I've given you. If you don't, God says, Neither can I be with you anymore, exactly as he said to Joshua and the children of Israel. You know, in Galatians 5, 9, it says, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. We must be very, very careful what we bring into our homes, into our lives, because remember, your sin, my sin, will not just affect myself. It flows out into the family, into the church, into the community. And often we can bring a curse into our own homes and our own families. Sadly, exactly as Achan did, we can do the same. So here we find he stole from God. He coveted the things of Babylon, number three. He stole God's time, number four. He brought the accursing into his home and actually destroyed his family as well. And the last point that I've got out of this is number five. He coveted his own way. Not only did he covet money and possessions of Babylon, he coveted it his own way. It's like God has said, this is the way. This is what I've told you. Don't do this. And he just did the, the exact opposite. And this is one of the great forms of coveting, I think, in our church today is that it's what I call spiritual coveting. We're just going to do it our own way. God has given us counsel. God has given us instruction. And we say, well, that's good, but I think we can do it the other way. We do what we like to do our own way, exactly as Achan did. Testimonies to Minister 486. It says, the religion of many among us will be the religion of apostate Israel because they covet, sorry, because they love their own way and forsake the way of the Lord. If we know God's will and we don't do it, we are simply coveting our own way. And today, through the Christian world, there are lots of controversies over doctrines and theologies, and much of it arises because people just covet their own way. They cannot just follow a plain, thus saith the Lord. 
And as we look at these five points of ACAM, we need to honestly ask ourselves the question. I have to ask myself the question today, am I an ACAM in the camp? Remember that statement that we started with the, at the beginning of our program, when the Spirit of Prophecy said that every church and almost every family has its ACAM. Am I the ACAN in the church? Am I the ACAN in the church in the five points that we've shared? Or maybe I'm an ACAN in the church on just one of those points. And you know, the Bible says we need to examine ourselves to see whether we hold to the faith. Know you not your own selves? 2 Corinthians 13 verse 5 tells us that. Examine yourself to see whether you hold to the faith. You know, in closing today, God is calling us, I believe, to a higher walk with him. He's calling for us to start putting him first. He's calling to the Achans in the church to repent, to turn away from their covetous ways. They're coveting the things of Babel on them, turning to take God's funds and use it for themselves, using their own time for themselves, allowing the church to do the work and not getting involved. And it's my prayer today that every one of us will examine ourselves and see whether we're holding to the faith, to see whether we're really working with God. Because my friend, the reality is if we're not with God, by default, we will be hindering the church. We'll be hindering the work. We'll be the stumbling block for other people in the church and our own families as well. So the challenge for all of us this morning is, am I an Achan in the camp? Am I walking with God? Am I faithful and true to what I know and understand? Am I growing daily? Do I have a passionate desire to, to take the kingdom of God, to, to reach out into the world with the gospel and hasten the coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? Or am I really just living for myself and church becomes a bit of a, a, bit of a club that we go to on Sabbath to meet our friends and the rest of the time we just do our own thing? In closing this morning, I want to just uh, finish with a verse that we've read already. If we go back to Joshua chapter 6, Joshua 6 and verse 18, notice these words again as a warning to us. And ye, in any wise, keep yourselves from the accursed thing, lest you make yourself accursed. When you take of the accursed thing and make the camp of Israel a curse and trouble it. May God bless each one of us to search our hearts, to examine our lives, to confess our sins and put them away. If we find ourselves or discover ourselves today to be an Achan, let's confess our sins. Let's put those sins away and God will work on our hearts. He will change us and he can turn us from a hindrance into a powerful worker for him in the church, drawing other people to, him, to the gospel, to himself, to the church and hasting the coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This is my prayer for each one of us this morning. Amen.